Welcome to Stories Podcast. This week, we are reading Margaret and Henry and the Room of Hay, a story adapted by me, Amanda Weldon. To support the show and help us keep releasing new episodes every week, please visit patreon.com slash stories or follow the links to our ebooks on storiespodcast.com. Thanks. Enjoy the episode. Margaret and Henry were super duper in love. They had grown up playing together by a stream in the woods behind both of their homes, and as they got older, they realized they were best friends and that they wanted to get married and spend the rest of their lives together. Normally, this is something to celebrate. It can take a very long time to find a person you think you can love and tolerate on a daily basis for eternity. Some people are lucky enough to find someone very early, some people don't find anyone until much later, And some people are happy on their own and would rather not spend all their time with anyone else, and that's fine too. But one thing's for sure, when two people tell each other that they're in love and would like to team up and spend the rest of their lives together, this is good news and there should be a party. But Margaret and Henry were concerned that they might not get to have a party or be a team at all. They weren't sure if their parents were going to be okay with it. The problem was that Henry was a prince. He lived in a giant castle with his parents, the king and queen, and his brothers and sisters, the other princes and princesses, and a bunch of aunts and uncles, who were dukes and duchesses. There were also cooks and gardeners, a butler and some servants, and also the royal dogs and cats, who sometimes wore teeny tiny crowns on their heads because it made everyone laugh. Margaret, on the other hand, lived in a cottage just outside the boundaries of the royal backyard. She lived with her mom, the town baker, And their house always smelled really good, like rising bread dough. And while she always smelled excellent, Margaret was not a princess, and that was kind of a problem. This story takes place a long time ago, and back then, choosing who to marry was more complicated than it is now. Instead of just finding a person that seemed cool and deciding to marry them, your whole family had to be involved in the decision. Sometimes people ended up getting married for political reasons, or for money, or because their parents thought it would be a good idea or something. Sometimes it worked out fine and everyone was happy, but not everyone got to marry someone they loved or even liked, so sometimes it was kind of a bummer. Nowadays, you can pretty much marry whoever you want as long as you're both grown-ups, and that's pretty cool. But this was not the case for Margaret and Henry. After talking about it for a little while, Margaret and Henry decided to talk to their respective parents and see if they could work something out. Margaret brought her mother, the baker, to the castle, and Henry made sure that his father, the king, would speak to them. When Margaret and her mother arrived in the king's court, the royal pets rushed to greet them, and the king boomed a brusque hello. I've heard that your daughter has had the nerve to fall in love with my son. Margaret's mother bristled at his condescension. I've heard that your son has had the nerve to fall in love with my daughter, she retorted with a scowl and the king smiled at her boldness. People didn't stand up to him very often, and it was kind of refreshing. Is your daughter as strong as you are? He asked the bold baker. Of course she is, the baker replied. I raised her. She's just as strong and twice as smart, and her hair is as beautiful as spun gold. Here is a secret about the king. He is a little hard of hearing. Actually, it wasn't really a secret. Everyone in the castle knew it, but they also knew better than to mention it. The king was a little vain and refused to acknowledge that anything about himself could possibly be less than perfect. Henry had not inherited this quality, just so you know. So when the baker told the king that his daughter's hair was as beautiful as spun gold, he heard something slightly different. Your daughter can spin hay into beautiful gold? Huh? said the baker, Margaret, and Henry all together. I've heard stories of people who can spin hay into gold, but I've never seen it with my own eyes. Very well, your daughter will stay here tonight, and if she can spin a room full of hay into gold, she can marry my son. If she cannot, she must leave and never come back. You can go now. You're dismissed. And the king's guards began to shuffle Margaret and her mother out of the king's court. What just happened? Margaret asked her mother. The king's baddie her mother said. You don't want to marry into a family like that. Yes, I do, said Margaret. Henry ran up alongside them as they were heading toward the castle door. That went better than I expected, 
said Henry, and both Margaret and her mother looked at him like he had three heads. Well, at least he didn't say no. But Henry, said Margaret, I can't spin hay into gold. I don't even think that's a real thing. Yeah, it's definitely not a real thing, said Margaret's mother. King's batty. You leave that to me, said Henry. I'll figure out how to make this work. We're going to spend the rest of our lives together, and it's going to be great. And he kissed Margaret quickly before rushing out the door into the woods to solve the hay into gold problem. The king's guards approached Margaret and her mother and led Margaret away to the room she'd be staying in overnight. And her mother, the baker, left, dreaming up new cookie recipes while she was walking home. The room the king's guards led Margaret to was ugly and gray and cold. It had stone walls and stone floors, and the ceilings were tall, like really tall, and it was filled with bales of hay. There was a spinning wheel in one corner with a little stool next to it. Do you have everything you need, miss? The king's guard asked. Um, sure. Margaret didn't know what to say, since she didn't actually need anything to spin hay into gold since she couldn't actually do it. You have 24 hours to fill this room with gold or you will be banished from the kingdom. Good luck. And he spun on his heel and slammed the door behind him, leaving Margaret alone in her room full of hay. Uh Uh-oh. A few hours later, Margaret hadn't made any progress. She tried rearranging the hay into different piles so it might look like some of it had disappeared, but she knew she wasn't fooling anyone. She tried spinning it in the spinning wheel just in case maybe she was actually magical, but the hay remained resolutely hay. As a last resort, Margaret tried buffing the hay so it would get shiny like gold, but that was a pretty dumb idea and it didn't work. Margaret was really in a pickle, and she couldn't figure out what to do. Where is Henry? she wondered aloud to herself, and just as she said it, she heard something tapping at her window. It was Henry, swinging from a rope outside. Let me in, this is terrifying, he called out, and Margaret unlocked the window, opened it, and Henry tumbled inside the room. I have a solution, he gasped from the bale of hay he'd landed on. I met this weird guy. After Margaret had been rushed out of the king's court, Henry had ventured into the vast woods that surrounded the castle. Everyone knew the woods were home to all sorts of strange and magical creatures, so Henry was hopeful that he would find someone who could help him there. He met a very nice witch named Griselda who was selling a bunch of really cool potions, but she didn't have anything that would turn hay into gold. He met some elves that taught him some songs that were apparently good luck spells, but Henry wasn't really sure he believed in that kind of thing, and besides, they would need more than good luck if they were going to pull this off. Still, one of the songs was very catchy, and he found himself singing it out loud as he continued to search through the woods. Rabbit's feet and four-leaf clovers, pots of gold with rainbows over. Number seven, ladybugs, all these things will bring good luck. Horseshoes, goldfish, acorns, hearts, wishing on a shooting star. Finding pennies, faced heads up, all these things will bring good luck. It must have worked, because finally, Henry stumbled upon the exact creature he needed to meet. He's this tiny man, Henry told Margaret in the room full of hay. He must be like two and a half feet tall or something, but his feet are huge, and he said he would turn the hay into gold. He also said that he would meet me here. Have you seen him? Uh, no. What's that smell? I don't know, said Henry, sniffing the air. It smells kind of like onions? And the room did smell like onions, and the smell was getting stronger. A cloud of purple smoke appeared in the center of the room and grew until Margaret and Henry could only see purple no matter where they looked. What's going on? Margaret cried. I think this is the guy, said Henry excitedly. And sure enough, the purple smoke began to clear, and a small man was left standing amidst the spinning wheel and the many bales of hay. His clothes were all the same purple as the smoke he'd rode in on, and every garment was made of lush, shimmering fabrics and trimmed in gold. Just as Henry had mentioned before, the tiny man had enormous feet and wore purple shoes with golden bells on them that jingled when he walked. 
He had a long, pointy black beard with a silver stripe in it and the bushiest eyebrows Henry and Margaret had ever seen. But he had absolutely no hair on his head. His nose was bulbous with a gold ring in one nostril and his eyes were a greenish gold color that seemed to almost glow. Hello, he said. I have heard that you may need some help with some gold. I do, yes, said Margaret. Well, we do. We can't get married unless I can spin all the hay in this room into gold, and I don't know how to do that. It would be amazing if you could help us. Yes, I am willing to help, but you must make me a promise. Sure, said Margaret. You must pay me for my services, and my fee is not cheap. Okay, well, I'm a prince, so I mean, I could probably afford it. You cannot back out of this promise after you make it. You have to deliver. Yeah, we get it. We're on board. What do you want? I want your first born child. Margaret and Henry looked at each other. That was kind of a weird thing for this guy to want. And Margaret and Henry hadn't even decided if they wanted to have kids yet. Do you think we should do it? Margaret whispered. That seems like maybe not the best deal in the world for us. Well, if we don't do it, we won't get to have any babies in the first place. True, but if we do have babies, won't we love them and want to keep them? Probably, but maybe we should just worry about that later. Okay. So Margaret and Henry agreed. They were pretty short-sighted. After Henry very, very carefully exited through the window again so as not to disturb the king's guards, the strange little man got to work. He pulled one bale of hay over to the wheel and began spinning. Thin strands of gold appeared where the hay had been. Whoa, said Margaret. How are you doing that? I am magic, obviously, the man said. Bring me more hay. So Margaret did. And then she brought some more, and the man just kept spinning and spinning. The only sounds in the room were the squeak of the wheel going round and round and strands of gold landing softly in a pile. That and the irritating jingle of the little golden bells on the man's shoes. Margaret tried to make conversation a few times, but that didn't go over too well. Apparently, the man liked to work in near silence. After a few hours of the awkward, excruciating quiet, Margaret almost couldn't handle it anymore. But then, all of a sudden, he was done. The hay in the room had all been transformed into glittering, silken strands of gold. I am done. You're welcome, the man said. And before Margaret could say thank you, the purple onion cloud filled the room again, and he was gone. Margaret peered out the window and saw the soft pink light of dawn in the sky as the sun rose, and she decided to try to get an hour or two of sleep before the king came to check on her. She nestled in amongst the gold, which was not as soft as it looked, and slipped off into a fitful slumber. After what felt like mere moments later, Margaret awoke from perhaps the worst sleep in her life to hear banging at her door. Ugh, come in, she called out groggily, and the king's guards flung the door open and the king entered the room and surveyed the piles of gold all over the floor. Henry was there, too, and when he saw that the odd little man had delivered on his promise, his whole face lit up in an enormous grin, and he gave Margaret two thumbs up. Margaret's mother, the baker, was also there, and when she saw the room full of gold, she immediately looked suspicious. She gave her daughter a look as if to say, how did you pull this off? But Margaret just smiled at her, and the baker decided that she would really rather not know. I am impressed, said the king. Okay, you can marry my son. And he turned to leave the room. Margaret and Henry were overjoyed. They ran into each other's arms and jumped and giggled and kissed and started imagining their future together and how happy they would be. The baker rolled her eyes because she still thought the king was batty and now she was going to have to be related to him. But she couldn't help but smile when she saw how happy her daughter was. Margaret and Henry were married in a huge, beautiful ceremony just a few months after the small, mysterious savior had spun the room full of gold for them. They lived together in the castle, and Margaret's mother came to visit often with delicious cakes and cookies for them. They spent their days volunteering in the village and spent their nights dancing and playing music and making art together. It was wonderful. They truly were living happily ever after.
Except they totally forgot that they owed that weird little man a baby. They got pregnant just a few years after they got married. They named their adorable little boy Rufus because they both thought it was a funny name that would always make them smile when they said it out loud. They had a blissful year with Rufus and were beyond excited to celebrate his first birthday with their families and everyone in the kingdom. They planned a big silly party with a puppy dog theme because Rufus loved puppy dogs, and the day that it arrived, it was sunny and bright and everything seemed perfect. Until that guy showed up. He appeared in his pungent purple cloud while Margaret and Henry were helping to clean up after the party. What's that smell? Margaret asked Henry as she piled up cake plates and gathered sticky spoons to bring to the kitchen to be washed. Doesn't it smell kind of familiar? Oh no, said Henry, and he and Margaret looked at each other as they remembered at the same time. Hello, said the man they now realized had come for their beloved Rufus. I believe you owe me something. But there must be something we can do, Margaret wailed to the man. She and Henry had been attempting to negotiate for hours to no avail. No, he said stubbornly as he had all night. You promise me your baby? I want your baby. Why do you even want him? He's always sticky and he cries all the time. Henry hoped that by saying these kind of mean but still true things about his son, he'd convince this mysterious stranger to ask for something else instead. I can offer you gold or, like, some chickens or something. Pretty much whatever you want that's not a human baby. I will take what has been promised to me, the man said stubbornly. Please, Margaret said, tears in her eyes. Give us a chance to earn him back. The little man looked at her shrewdly, eyes narrowed. Fine, he said. If you can guess my first name, I won't take your son. You get three nights to guess, but I guarantee you'll never get it. And with that, the noxious purple cloud filled the air again, and the man disappeared. Margaret and Henry lit candles to rid the air of the stubborn, oniony smell, and Margaret began to cry in earnest. He said we'll never be able to guess his name, and he's probably right, and then he's going to take Rufus, and I love Rufus, and everything is terrible. (laughs) Seriously? said Henry. I thought that went really well. What? shrieked Margaret. I feel like we view scenarios really differently. Think about it, said Henry. I found him in the woods, right? He must live there, so someone must know his name. Listen, I kind of got us into this since I found him in the first place. Let me retrace my steps, and I promise that I'll figure out his name before the three nights are up. Margaret quieted down then, but she wasn't anywhere near as confident as Henry was. Still, there was nothing she could do in that moment but hold her baby and her husband close and hope that everything would work out. The next morning, after a restless night of sleep, Henry set off into the forest to find out the tiny man's name. He kissed Margaret goodbye and assured her again that everything would work out and promised that he would return as soon as he knew it. Margaret went to work too. When she and Henry were trying to decide what to call their baby, they'd made lists and lists of possible names and Margaret was sure that they'd left them somewhere. Margaret and Henry were kind of pack rats. Margaret wanted to be ready when the man got there and she knew that if she didn't have a list out in front of her, she'd just sputter and stumble and waste all their valuable guessing time just trying to come up with names. She finally located the long scroll on which they'd made their baby name list stuffed in the back of one of the drawers of the massive desk they kept in their bedroom. It had name after name after name on it, all in alphabetical order, because Henry loved to alphabetize. Margaret was ready. Night was beginning to fall, and the sun was sinking down behind the mountains in a wild orange glow. Margaret was gazing out the window and wondering when Henry would return, when the purple onion smoke filled the room. Margaret held her nose. It was really a pretty gross smell. Hello, the little man said as he materialized in the middle of the room. Begin guessing now. Um, don't you want a glass of water or anything like that? Begin guessing now, he said with conviction, and Margaret was reminded of how uncomfortable she'd been sitting in silence when he was spinning the hay into gold. This guy had super questionable social skills. Margaret rolled her eyes and guessed. Alphonse? No. Armand? No. Arturo? No. And she kept guessing. And she kept guessing. B. 
Barrett? No. Bernie? No. Bob? No. Anne kept guessing. Cadbury? No. Clement? No. Cornelius? No. This went on for hours. Margaret made it through all the A's, the B's, the C's, and half of the D's before the sun rose. None of the names were his name, apparently. As the tiny man disappeared into his foul cloud, Margaret couldn't help but feel discouraged. Though the alphabetical name scroll had not been their plan A, she'd hoped his name might be on it, and they could settle this all sooner rather than later. It was such an exhaustive list, after all. But alas, it was only the first night. And Henry was still out there looking. Margaret took a few deep breaths to dissipate her increasing anxiety and went to go wake her son. So far, Henry had not had much luck. He'd bumped into the witch Griselda he'd met the last time he'd been there, and they had a nice time catching up. Unfortunately, though, when Henry described the little man with the ring in his nose and the big feet who traveled by way of Onion Cloud, Griselda was unable to help him. So Henry went on his way. He asked every person who crossed his path, Excuse me, have you met a very small man who wears only purple and smells like onions and can spin hay into gold? But so far, he wasn't having any luck. As he walked through the woods he had walked through a few years before, he remembered the song that he'd learned and sung on his last trip. Before long, it was stuck in his head again, and he started singing it aloud. Rabbit's feet and four-leaf clovers, pots of gold with rainbows over. Number seven, ladybugs, all these things will bring good luck. Horseshoes, goldfish, acorns, hearts Wishing on a shooting star Finding pennies, faced heads up All these things will bring good luck The silly little song helped buoy Henry's spirits as he continued to trek through the dense forest, hoping to find the name of the man who wanted to steal his child. The second night of guessing went about as well as the first for Margaret. Henry had not yet returned, so she continued to make her way through their long, long list of names to no avail, and the small purple man continued to be super awkward. Is it Deepak? No. Digby? No. Dougie? No. What about Ernest? No. Elroy? No. Esteban? No. Margaret was getting frustrated. How about Felix? No. Francesco? No. Fritz? No. Gaston? No. Gideon? No. Guillermo? No. Margaret made it through a lot more of the list on the second night, but the tiny man kept gleefully shouting no at every name, which frankly was making Margaret a little angry. When he finally disappeared into his cloud of smoke, Margaret was very glad to see him go. Where is Henry? She wondered aloud. Henry had hit the jackpot. He'd been walking through the woods for days and nights, questioning everyone he found about the little man, stopping only briefly to rest and eat, when he stumbled on a family of enormous ogres. He introduced himself and then asked the question he'd been asking everyone. By any chance, have you met a very small man who wears only purple and smells like onions and can spin hay into gold? He'd asked this question so often now and with no results, so he was tired and he wasn't expecting much. Sure. One of the ogres who'd introduced herself as Bridget said, Why do you ask? Henry almost couldn't believe his ears. You know him? He shouted, totally unable to contain his excitement. Yeah, we do, said the other ogre, Virgil. And he owes us a lot of money. Do you know where we can find him? He owes you money, said Henry. That's so weird. He can spin hay into gold. Why wouldn't he have paid you back that way? He can spin hay into gold, said Bridget. Oh, he is going to get a piece of my mind. Well, right now he's at my house making my wife guess his first name. And if she doesn't figure it out, then we're going to have to give him our baby. Do you know his name? They did. Henry was overjoyed. Thank you so much, he shouted, already on his way back to the castle. I'll name my next kid after you. You guys are great. The final night had come, and Margaret was really at the end of her rope. This tiny man was terrible, First of all, he had a totally inscrutable first name, and no matter what, she couldn't figure it out. Second of all, he was rude, and he would never exchange pleasantries with her, and every exchange they had was awful and stilted, and she hated it. 
Margaret was, by nature, a very chatty person, and the fact that he refused to chat with her was just offensive. Thirdly, her whole wing of the castle smelled like onions now. But none of that was as awful as the fact that this person wanted to steal her baby, who was easily her favorite alive being in the world. She was angry with him and his smug face and practically shouting names at him now. Jedediah! No. Carl? No. Leonardo? No. Ah! She shouted in frustration. I'm never gonna get it! Montgomery? No. Nathan? No. Ollie? No. Time was passing, and there were fewer and fewer names on the list. Where was Henry? Margaret's panic was growing more and more intense, and her whole body felt alive with fear and nerves. Tears stung her eyes, and she could feel her heart pounding in her chest. Pablo? No. Quentin? No. Remington? No. She could hear a knock at the window, and her husband was there, dangling on a rope, just like he had been when she was waiting for him in a room full of hay all those years ago. He had a huge grin on his face, even though he also looked terrified, and she felt a weight lift off her shoulders. She ran to the window and flung it open, pulling her husband inside. I know it, he cried. It's... No, she said. Let me say it. I've been guessing for so long. Henry rolled his eyes and whispered it in her ear. Margaret turned on her heels, her eyes narrowed and spiteful. She pointed her finger at the tiny purple man with the ring in his nose and the enormous feet with the bells on them, and she shouted, Rumble Stiltskin! The man gasped. His eyes widened in shock. How did you know? He screamed in anger, and then he began stomping his feet hard. He stomped and stomped and stomped so hard that he made a giant hole in the floor beneath him and fell through, leaving a purple onion cloud in his wake. Margaret and Henry were overjoyed. They hugged each other and kissed and ran to the other room and woke up sleeping Rufus, and they hugged and kissed him too. They were going to be able to be a family forever, and everything was okay. They were all exhausted. Margaret and Henry because they had barely slept for three days, and Rufus because he was a baby, and babies are almost always tired. So they went to bed and slept. When they awoke hours later, Margaret got up to get them some food and happened to notice the long scroll of names on the floor near where she had been sitting and guessing. She looked at it and laughed out loud. What's so funny? Henry asked, careful not to awake Rufus, who was sleeping peacefully on his chest. The next name on the list, said Margaret. It was Rumpelstiltskin. Margaret and Henry's life calmed down significantly after all this drama had passed. They had two more babies, named, as promised, for the ogres that had helped Henry that day in the woods, Bridget and Virgil. Their children grew big and strong and kind and silly, and they were very happy. Margaret decided to publish that very long list of names she and Henry had created when they were deciding what to name their children, and it was an instant bestseller among expectant parents. Henry eventually became king, and he was very careful not to be as power-hungry and elitist as his father had been. Together, he and Margaret abolished all the rules that made it hard for people in love to get married, so no one else would have to indebt themselves to some creepy little magic guy from the woods just to spend their lives with their chosen partner. They would be known in history books as the King and Queen of Hearts. All in all, everything worked out pretty well. The End Thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.